You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Ian Truscott hosts a great podcast called Rockstar CMO. Ian, tell us what these fine folks will get when they listen. Well, Jason, I'm no rock star, but I've picked up a thing or two over the last 20 years on my turf from sysadmin to CMO. And each week I chat with the true rock stars, my fabulous guests and chums, and share what we call marketing street knowledge to inspire our listeners in a rock star. Amazing. Where can people subscribe? Go to Rockstar cmo.com find the show at marketingpodcast.net or search for rockstar cmo fm wherever you get your podcasts you heard him go subscribe you may know you're listening to this show along the marketing podcast network but did you know there are other great shows on mpn to help your business seth goldstein hosts a great podcast called entrepreneurs enigma seth tell us what these fine folks will get when they listen they will get me introducing them to some great entrepreneurs who have either found their way through the journey of entrepreneurship or who are entering entrepreneurship and can share their experiences amazing where can people subscribe they can subscribe over at entrepreneursenigma.com. They can go over to marketingpodcast.net, or they can just go to their directory of choice. I'm in there. And if I'm not, email me. Awesome. You heard him, folks. Go subscribe. I'm Nick Westergaard, and this is On Brand, helping you tell your story. My guest this week is Jill Ong. I think that it is essential for brands to be authentic and to remember what they stand for. And especially for a brand like Converse, I think what they did was the right step in terms of honoring what people know them for, right? Which is the Chuck Taylor. But yes, there needs to be an evolution of products in order to keep up with the times and to satisfy customers in terms of like what they're looking for. Jill Ong has spent her whole career of 22 years in advertising working on iconic brands like Converse, Beats by Dre, and Sonos. She has developed deep expertise on global business and the APAC region with work experience spanning China, New York, Hong Kong, and Singapore. She moved to New York in 2010 during the Big Recession and has been in the Anomaly Ace family ever since. As managing director of Ace, she's charged with inspiring and nurturing people and optimizing operations across Ace. Jill, welcome to On Brand. Thank you, Nick. It's great to be here. I am excited to chat. Uh, your your career has taken you uh, really uh, across the world and uh, <laughs> and and work with with great brands along the way as as well. You know, I, I love. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge. I'm I'm a shoe person. Which means I'm, I'm, I'm a big Converse fan, and I always cite them as, as, as your bio just said, as, as an iconic brand. Uh, talk a bit about taking the reins of of a brand that already means so much to so many. Yeah, I mean, I would say that Converse to date is still the best brand I've ever worked on and for various reasons for what the brand stands for, but also the people that I've worked with from clients to my own team at Anomaly. And, you know, I worked on it for seven years and that was the reason that I moved from Shanghai to New York, um, you know, to run the global Converse business, which at that time honestly, in 2010, was just uh, America and Europe. And it was like specifically London. And, you know, they were at kind of like an inflection point because Converse has been around for a long time. It's like a brand that's over 100 years old. So, you know, back in 2010, they were struggling a little with being relevant to youth, which is their key target audience. And, and part of what we had to do was to go, hey, how do we make a heritage brand relevant again to a new generation that didn't grow up with it and didn't know the history of the brand? Um, so, you know, to do that, we obviously did a lot of product campaigns, but the one that really sticks out is in 2015, you know, the Chuck Taylor for Converse has always been 
the one shoe that that people associate with Converse, right? And they were on on the verge of launching a new shoe called the Chuck Two. But you know, from chatting with the clients, I think we we were afraid that people would go, "What the Chuck Two? The Chuck Taylor is so revered, and why do you want to like do a new a new rendition of it?" And we felt that we needed to celebrate what the Chuck Taylor stood for, you know, and and the essence of it, and and to do that, we were like, "All right, like what is a global insight?" Because this is a this was a global campaign. So what was a global insight that could tie, you know, every market together? And at Converse, their their mission at that time was always that they believed that creativity could change the world. And what they were what they wanted to do was to serve their community in helping people be creative. And if you look at the Chuck Taylor, and if you go on the streets and you look at people, how they wear their Chuck Taylors, it varies, right? Some people like to wear it clean. Some people like to bedazzle them. Some people like to write on them. Uh, some people like them plain in black. And some people like, like, you know, the brightest colors. And I think what we realized was that you know, people keep their old Chuck Taylors as well. And and it is a, a an expression of themselves. And even though it's just a shoe, it wasn't just a shoe. It was like a blank canvas for them to express their creativity or to tell the world who they are. And so this the the idea, and that was like the really the true insight that triggered what the Chuck Taylor stood for. And we then went, all right, what if like we went all over the world and and found Chuck Taylors that belong to regular people, but also like famous people, and we showcase all these Chuck Taylors as pieces of art, you know, that that we want that that to celebrate the creativity over the hundred years. And it was challenging, I'm going to admit, with the client at first, where, you know, with shoe companies, and you'll see this all over, they always want to show their shoe in the most pristine form, which is brand new. <laughs> so what we were asking them to do was a little, you know, unorthodox, where we said, hey, we want to show, like, we want to shoot people's dirty chucks. And they were like, what? This isn't what... Like th- this is very against like everything that we do. So it did take a bit of convincing for them to see like, look, like everyone has a pair of chucks, even deep in the wardrobe. Somebody who hasn't worn chucks for 15 years has kept that pair of chucks and it means something to them. And I think like, oh, like they eventually they came around and what we did was that we sent scouts all around the world to find unique looking chucks. So it could be a pair that uh, a movie extra wore in a zombie flick that is stained with blood and there's a story there to tell. You know, or it could be Andy Warhol's chucks that we went to his museum in Pittsburgh to photograph. And so, you know, the great thing about this campaign And having worked on global businesses, you see this a lot where, you know, campaigns are developed out of the global headquarters, which is usually in America or in Europe. And then you have all the local markets going, hmm, that doesn't work in my market. But this was truly the first campaign that I've worked on and that, as far as I know, at Converse at that time, where everyone felt like, whoa, okay, I can see this working in my market and I want to be a part of this and I want to help by giving by, by bringing you these, these chucks that I find in my market. So we, we harnessed that. We found like over 300 pairs of chucks. We photographed them as portraits, like beautiful against a white background. But the whole thing was that every pair, every portrait was signed by the person that 
it belonged to. And so you have like a beautiful like like gallery of imagery and we had like media principles behind it where we said, look, in media, you can never run a single unit by itself because the whole premise of this campaign was that it's an exhibition. So you need to run them in the minimum of like three units. And, and from there, you saw like in Hong Kong, we took over like, you know, like their MTR, which is like their subway. They have long kind of like uh, walkways and we covered like both sides of the walkways. In London, it was in train stations. In New York, you saw them on the streets. You saw them in subways. Um, but we took it even further than that. We created uh, exhibitions in every market. So every market could could then go, okay, we're going to do an exhibition of, of like the key portraits that we want to feature, but there was an added experience onto it. So for North America, we did it in the Flatiron in New York, and we created four separate stories, which were communicated through virtual reality, which at that time was like a big thing. This is like back in 2015. So we used like Google, a cardboard Google goggles, and you could just use your own phone. And the reason that we did that instead of using some fancy kind of, you know, virtual reality device was also that we felt that it really fit in with what Converse stood for. Converse is all about being scrappy, about being creative. So we felt that that was a really good fit. And what we did was that we created four stories and each story, when you put on the goggles, you are placed in, in the first person perspective of the, of like the person wearing the shoes. So one of it was a a zombie extra, as I mentioned earlier, where he would... He, you're, you're in a movie and you think you're being attacked by zombies and you're freaked out. And, you know, a minute in, someone yells cut and you realize that you're on a movie set. So it was really an immersive experience into that pair of chucks and who that person was behind it. Um, so that was like how it came to life um, in an experiential form. And then, you know, what was great, too, was that people started doing their own portraits and we didn't even encourage it. Right. Like I remember talking with the clients and one of the things we talked about before launching was, do we create some kind of an app that lets people do their own portraits? And in the end, we said no, because it felt fabricated and it felt like it didn't tie in with what Converse stood for as a brand. And what happened eventually was that people started photographing their own and cobbling together their own portraits. And there were like hundreds of these on social media. And I think that that was really a true testament that the insight really resonated with people and that people wanted to be a part of that campaign. On Brand, we'll be right back after this. You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Sarah Panous hosts a great podcast called Marketing with Empathy. Sarah, tell us what these fine folks will get when they listen. Marketing with Empathy is a weekly podcast, and it's designed for brand content marketers who want to connect with their audiences through storytelling and are looking for help to do it better. Plus, like enjoy that recognition, growth, and just joy that comes from creating great work. Awesome. Where can people subscribe? Yeah, head on over to marketingpodcast.net and you will see the Marketing with Empathy show there. Otherwise, wherever you listen to podcasts, you'll find Marketing with Empathy. You heard her. Go subscribe. You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Matt Bailey hosts a fantastic podcast called The Endless Coffee Cup. Matt, tell these fine folks what they'll get when they listen. At Endless Coffee Cup, we go beyond the headlines with a regular discussion of marketing news, media, and culture about our complex digital lifestyle. 
Of course, with my emphasis on education, I have great guests from all over the world that share their stories, giving listeners unique insights into their experiences and expertise. Sounds super useful. Where can people subscribe? They can go to my website at sitelogic.com or find the show at marketingpodcast.net. Or hey, we're everywhere, wherever you get your podcast. You heard him. Go subscribe. Now, back to the show. You know, what you said is is so important in in a lot of different fronts. One, you talk about, you know, part of the the double-edged sword of an iconic brand like Converse is mm-hmm. is is expanding beyond Chucks with 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 Chuck 2s uh and mm-hmm. and really being able to transfer that meaning essentially to to other other lines. So how do you grow a great brand when you have an established meaning in, you know, whether it's in a product or a line and 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 expand that meaning to other aspects of of the brand and business? I think that it is essential for brands to be authentic and to remember what they stand for. And especially for a brand like Converse, I think what they did was the right step in terms of honoring what you know people know them for, right? Which is the Chuck Taylor. But yes, there needs to be an evolution of products in order to keep up with the times and, and to satisfy customers in terms of like what they're looking for. So you know, in terms of silhouette, and these days, if you go to the Converse stores, I've seen the cra- craziest silhouettes. But I think what is still recognizable is the general silhouette and, and kind of what the brand stands for, I think is still the same. You know, people associate it with artists, with musicians, with, you know, fashion. And I think that there is like somewhat of a protecting what those values are and making sure that whatever you expand into, that those values are kept sacred. But then you're mixing it with like a modern take. So, you know, and I I think that that is the case a lot, right? Like we live in a very different world now where when I started out, you just did print ads and you did like television commercials. Now brands are on social media and, and the landscape is different. But I think that the fundamentals remain the same in terms of like your brand, you need to communicate what you stand for and you need to stand by that but then at the same time you need to evolve your values to fit with you know what's happening right now and sometimes the bridging of that gap is kind of combining the old and the new and making sure that you're kind of borrowing stuff from the new but staying true to what the original intention and values are. That's such a great point, and an, an important aspect of that feels like balance in there too of 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 the new and the old. As you look at your career, you've you've had, as we mentioned earlier, a, a global career working on mm-hmm. global brands, and I think that's the world that many of us find ourselves in if we're building brands for a global environment you mentioned this a little bit with 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 converse but what are important things to consider when it comes to global brand building so i think that the key in building a global brand is really in establishing you know the values of what you stand for But then kind of going through and going, what is the insight that can link all my markets together? So, you know, one of the brands that I've worked for in the past is Weight Watchers. And we won the business at a time when they were trying to evolve with the times. From being a weight loss company, they wanted to be a wellness company. And this is a brand similar to Converse that has been around for decades. 
And when you look at different markets from America to Europe to Australia, they all have different um, views of weight loss, of nutrition, and of wellness. So we needed to find a universal insight that could fit with every single market, no matter what stage they were at. And that involved finding a true insight that would resonate with with all markets. And for Weight Watchers, it was that wellness is for everybody. Weight Watchers is wellness that works for everybody. And it doesn't matter who you are, and it doesn't matter whether you're trying to lose five pounds or 50 pounds. We have the product that is made for you wherever you are in your journey. And so that was like an insight. So I really think that that it is a true insight that can drive, you know, making a global brand relevant in all markets. And I'm not saying that that's easy because it takes time to find something that resonates. And then not just with consumers, but then you, you know, as an agency person, you need to also convince your clients in different markets that that is the solution and that that is the insight that will unlock everything. So another key aspect of your bio, you talked about uh, ending up in New York uh, during the Mm -hmm. big recession. And we're starting to talk more and more about the that that daunting r word once again of the recession Mm -hmm. and as we look to a new year ahead and brands are thinking what should we be doing in this environment are there important things when it comes to planning and brand building with a a pending recession I mean, that's a great question. And I think that that's something that is on everyone's mind right now. And, you know, moving into the recession, people's, people's budgets are going to be tight, right? And, and, you know, we have to be strategic about how we communicate and what we're saying to them. And I think that a lot of like the the traditional ways of talking to consumers, like a Super Bowl ad, are you really going to spend $5 million doing a Super Bowl ad? Probably not, because you need to be a bit more smart with like your budgets. And I think that brands need to really see where their audiences are and think about how they are consuming media and purchasing and needing to fit into that seamlessly. And I think, you know, promotions and all that will only last you so long. I think at the end of the day, what still stands true is that brand loyalty is what is going to ride, is going to make you survive the recession. People need to feel loyal to a brand, to want to still buy a brand even when times are tough. And I think that that comes from a brand not just being about a product anymore. It's about what a brand believes in, right? So, you know, at Ace, we did a campaign for like Panera, which was like a fast food you know, option. And, and you could just like say, all right, we sell food, we sell sandwiches and soups. But, you know, what we, what we did was like, Hey, you know, Panera is transitioning to, to being a, a clean company in terms of like the ingredients that it uses. And we knew that that was something that would resonate with our audience. So we created content that spoke to all all that different the different aspects of how their food is created. You know, from where they source their food to using like pure ingredients. And we created content around it that wasn't specifically about 
selling a sandwich or a soup, but it was about the ethos of the company. And I think that brands do have to kind of stay true to to that, right? To who, who they are, what they believe in, and making sure that those beliefs are communicated to their consumers so that even when times are hard, consumers still know what they stand for. And, you know, they might not be able to purchase it as often, but if they can, they will still buy that product. And I think that loyalty is really going to differentiate, you know, the brands that survive and those that don't. That's such an important point about both communicating, thinking twice about what you're doing, uh, but also uh-huh. that it, it, this is it, it's an in, it's a window of time that is, is challenging to be sure. But you made such a great point about it, it about about being able to connect and build loyalty for people and uh-huh. and really really meaningful connection to at, at what could be a, a challenging time. You know, you mentioned Panera, which is a brand that makes me smile because it is so hard to eat well when you're on the go. And it is, mm-hmm. uh, I love, that's why I love when I find a, a Panera out there in the, in the world. Uh, Jill, what is a brand that has made you smile recently? I think that there are two two brands that have made me smile. Okay, I watch a lot of TV. It's kind of part of my job, but then it is a guilty pleasure of mine. <laughs> and I'm always subjected to ads on Hulu. And one that makes me smile every single time I see it, it's the progressive insurance the one that is about making that insurance is difficult but you don't have to become your parents (laughs) and I guess to me that really resonates with me because I'm getting older and things like that are really daunting to me and so when I see things like that where I go oh my god I'm starting to do things like that it it makes me smile and laugh. And the great thing about that campaign is that it doesn't even talk about anything to do with their product. Yeah. It's really resonating on that insight. And for me, even though I don't know what plans they have, I don't know what's <laughs> good about it, but if I ever need insurance, I, that's going to be top of mind for me to go, oh, I guess I should look at Progressive and, and look at that and see what they have. And, They've done a good job of having multiple spots that, you know, are based and rooted in humor. And as you know, humor is a really, really difficult thing to do in commercials. And I think that they've done that really well. So that's one thing that, that's made me smile. Um, the other one that's more recent, and this is so random, and it's something that I would never think that it's like, that I would like is the Belvedere vodka with Daniel Craig. Uh, And, you know, it was just, it was just really unexpected. I didn't know where it was going with it. And it showcased Daniel Craig in a way that I had never seen him. (laughs) And it was funny, you know, like I got the whole, Oh yeah, he was James Bond and he likes to drink martinis. And I get that. But they didn't even like leverage that, which I'm glad because that that is such a trope that is predictable. Yeah. So I think it's really the unpredictability of it that made me stop and smile and go, all right, that was pretty awesome. And I'm going to remember Belvedere Vodka now when I go to a bar. Those are a couple of great smiles. You know, some people get challenged by just the, the question for one brand, and 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 you got you brought two, which are great. And the progressive example, like you said, is is probably the best equation for why brands that make a smile matter because we end up thinking mm-hmm. about them. We have a connection there, and that has implications the next time we're we're shopping for insurance. Well, Jill, this has been a a great conversation. As we wrap up, where can folks go to learn more about who you are and what you do? Well, you know, I 
am on LinkedIn. You can see all the campaigns that I've worked on. But, you know, I work for Ace Content, which is based here in New York. And so a lot of the the stuff that I talked about can also be found on the website, acecontent.com. So, yeah, like I'm always around. I always love to banter about ads and TV shows. So hit me up. Awesome. Well, we will link up to all of that in our show notes, which folks can find at onbrandpodcast.com. Jill, thanks for being on brand with us. Thank you so much for having me. On Brand is part of the Marketing Podcast Network. If you like what you're hearing, if we've made you smile, you can always listen free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your favorite platform may be. And please take a moment and rate and review the podcast to help others find the show. Until next week, I'm Nick Westergaard, and I'll see you on the internet. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.